good evening or afternoon depending where you're looking from we are here to have a live with claudia fontes we're waiting for claudia to connect there she's connecting we're gonna be talking with claudia fontes who is in england hola hola hello how are you yeah very well thank you and you i'm good very well and um, thank you for being with us uh, in the in the studio series, and uh, we are super thrilled to have you. And thank you, Claudia, thank for joining you. us. And thank, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> I don't know if you want to tell people a little bit of where you are. Um... At the moment, I'm in Brighton at my home. Um, mm -hmm. It's quite late. I'm sorry, I'm not in the studio because it's, it's snowing outside and it's quite cold, and the Wi-Fi connection is not optimal. So I agree decided to do it from here um yeah i've been living in brighton for oh i lost the count i think it's almost 20 years <laughs> oh wonderful About. yes yeah. for a long time uh yeah. claudia is originally from argentina but she's been living in england for you know two decades already and developing a career internationally and uh, she represented argentina in the venice biennial and i mean had shows all over the place but so we're going to start seeing uh, some works from from her. So bear me patient while I put the works. You might see me disappear because there's a glitch with Instagram. Mm, that's been happening lately, but that's okay. The important thing is to see Claudia and the works and to have her describe her practice, which I think is um, an amazing opportunity. Mm. So if I am right, we start here. Is it? I think we had one Let before. Ah, uh, here it is. Here <laughs> it is. The order got switched. Yeah. But so, yes. Um, no, I, I just wanted to share that uh, during the pandemic, um, at the beginning, I had a lot of time to reflect on my practice. So to me, it was like a blessing. So that's why I decided to start showing some old pieces. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes I think that during the creative process, you leave notes um, for the future, for yourself in the future. Mm -hmm. and, and at some point, 20 years later, I say, oh, of course. Yeah, that's what, um, that, I got it. <laughs> now I get it. Um, mm -hmm. This piece is from the 1995, so it's very old. Um, but I wanted to, to talk a little bit about it because it's, um, as you can, I think you can tell, it's a pillow made out of soap, mm -hmm. supported by a, by a pillar um, made out of marble, the marble pillar. And while it was, um, while exhibiting it, there was a dripping of, of water that was fall, falling on the trace of the head left mm. on the pillow, mm. on the what would be the weight of the of the head, um, and what I wanted to to explain to you about this, or to, to let you know about this place, I lately realized is that I was already using um, a kind of concept that I'm I'm going deeper these days on that is uh, using the, the understanding the artwork as a decoy. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, I, I quite like the idea that uh, the, that pillow is not quite representing a pillow, but it is a pillow made out of soap. Um, the soap pretends to mimic the, the marble, but at the same time it's showing itself because of the water. So there is no deceit mm -hmm. um, in pretending that that is a pillow it is very clearly what it is and it's also a moment of my career when I uh, the concept of my work always started uh, in married with the material mm -hmm. for me um, I, I do not give up on materials so for me it's a source of of thinking of understanding the world through them so that's why um, Came out. It also is is part of um, a series of work. When I started doing a sculpture, I actually started making costumes for theatre, mm -hmm. and I was hanging out more with people from theatre than with for with people from the visual arts. That mm -hmm. was my way way into it. So the reference of the body is always important in my work because of that, and also the idea of creating a scene or. Um, um, yeah, the theatricality of it. I think it's also something that we will see later. So mm -hmm. that's why. 
that's a bit interesting. I think I'm gonna move you. It's okay, wonderful. Yeah. Claudia, can I ask you something? Where were you practicing theater also? Were you an actress or like a stage designer or? I mean, beyond the... Um, I trained as a painter and when mm -hmm. I finished uh, my studies and, and I studied history of art, so mm -hmm. in the same place that you studied. <laughs> mm -hmm. But oh, nice. the years before, yeah, at the University of Buenos Aires. Um, and uh, when I finished, um, I'm having trouble propping up my telephone. So no, no problem. It's okay. Uh, These are informal chats. When chat. I finished, because mm -hmm. I had to connect it. When I finished um, my degree as a painter, I realized I wasn't a painter. That I, I really think in 3D. So it mm -hmm. was a problem. So to start <laughs> uh, making sculpture, because I didn't want to come back to, you know, do again the whole course in sculpture. Um, so I started practicing acrobatics I know. with theater people. That's how I, I, I was acquainted with people from theater. And that was because I decided, okay, if, if a sculpture is, um, is to put a body in the space, I need to be aware. I mean, I was 20 something. I mm -hmm. need to be aware of my own body first and my own center of gravity and, and how I stand on the ground. <laughs> That's and wonderful. then I will be able to translate that into any object. And mm -hmm. that's why I say the, the somatic knowledge, let's say, <laughs> that is behind the work is super important to me. And when I go and see a show of any other artist, no matter mm -hmm. how conceptual they are, I usually, that's my first um, approach to any materiality in this world, really. That's really interesting. That's really interesting also in regards to what we were saying about materiality. Um, that's wonderful. Okay, let's go to the next work. I think this time, yes, we have these two images. Yeah, this is part of, um, I went for, I've been for two years as a resident at the Rijks Academy in Amsterdam. Um, mm -hmm. I, coincidentally, I was there with Carlos Amorales. I think he was and I, yeah. your piece before. Yeah, friends, right before but, you, last week. Yeah. And then we go and see it again in Venice, so that was funny. Um, I, when I was in Holland, uh, as, I, as soon as I arrived, um, I got this label of being non-Western. And for me, it was like a cultural shock because I was coming from this town in, in the suburbs of Buenos Aires called Aedo, mm -hmm. that people, all the area call it the West. So I thought, you cannot <laughs> be more Western than me. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Um, yeah. So I started playing with that, uh, with that label a lot. And um, so I decided to, to do a plan of invasion to Holland. Mm. And the plan of invasion, so it was a kind of a strategy of decolonization of, of the labels that they were putting on myself. So mm. I thought, well, you know, if you want to, if you want to, to um, address to myself in those colonial, I think, terms, I, I will do the same to you. Mm -hmm. um, so I, during two years, I did this plan of invasion that was actually, yeah. And uh, it had three actions. The first action was called a wood wooden dog. Um, and so I did this decoy of a dog in wood and it worked wonderfully with the dogs. That, so mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, well, it was an experiment in ethology. We, um, yeah, I didn't know how the dogs would react to that. Mm -hmm. But my idea was to capture um, Specific spectator. I didn't know who the spectator would be, but as you say, you know, I think, you know, all artworks are site specific, never mind where they are shown. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to go a bit more beyond that and, and find and, and build a close relationship with an spectator of my work. Um, so much so as to dedicate the work to that person, but without mm -hmm. knowing that person, which was a bit crazy. <laughs> So I went to, um, I also wanted to use my objects as the only um, um, means of, of communication because mm -hmm. I hardly could speak Dutch by then. This was the first month of being in, in Holland. Mm -hmm. And uh, not that I can speak now anyway. Um, so I, I put, I started doing these actions in a park full of immigrants. So immigrants in Holland, they all speak Dutch. If you go outside of, of that in Amsterdam, they usually speak in English to you. Mm -hmm. So uh, I forced myself not to be able to, to talk. And um, 
Yeah, uh, it, I just wanted to show it this because again, the decoy, uh, uh, the aspect of, of using a decoy as methodology to capture, you know, to in a way it's a parody of the whole um, uh, thing that happens around showing artwork in a gallery. Because I had my spectators, I had my artwork, I even had someone who wanted to buy it from me. So, you know, <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, I didn't have the press, but you would say, you know, who knows, the dogs were doing something. But yeah, you can roll the, the pictures because there's a few of those. Oh, okay. Uh, the second action was called um, the Invisible Tree. And what I did, I uh, at some point they pruned the trees in the park and I collected one piece of, of green wood that was still alive. And I carved into that piece a tree from Argentina, un ombu. Mm -hmm. You know them very well. Uh, the tree that is native to Argentina, I carve it in a wood that is native to, to the Netherlands. And I planted it. And I mm -hmm. convinced the person, Lottie, the person who, who I had acquainted by with the dogs, mm -hmm. um, with a wooden dog, um, to that it would grow, that I wanted it to grow in, in Dutch uh, territory. And that was mm -hmm. my plan of invasion. Uh, highly metaphorically. <laughs> and very good humble very yeah. hidden uh, and, she and also just to share with people i mean an ombu is that gigantic tree it's actually yeah. technically an, a her an herb it's not really a tree it's a gigantic herb and it's it grows herb, like exactly. all over the place and it's, it's very and it's, again the, i mean i made it out of my heart and out of somatic memory because it was a tree that i used to climb in my childhood and uh, well so Lottie started taking care of it until uh, the tree disappeared mm -hmm. uh, and the story goes on and on but what i like of, of this story is that the only thing i have about that tree is the drawing that she made of it and mm -hmm. gave it to me. So again, it's about like a game of representation where the 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 copy um, mm -hmm. it is the original in a way because the original doesn't exist. It's, it's an in, the original is like an in between between her, me, the tree of my childhood, etc. So that's wonderful. Uh, the problem of representation is something that I'm really intrigued of. Is 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 I think is something that um, conceptual art. Um, you know, hides behind idealism and as a way of solving, you know. Uh, but in order to do so, you need to resign to to materiality. That is something I'm not going to give up on. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to find a way of, of dealing with, um, yeah, these, these issues. So, yep. Let's see a third part. Uh, yeah, this is, oh, we decided, uh, yeah, uh, this is called about thinking, thinking, uh, or thinking, and it was the last action of this plan of invasion. I had a boat in Amsterdam for two years, you know, it was my means of transport, and by the end of the two years, I made a replica of that boat, I made it small, and I sank that boat in the same park that there was a dike, um, Mm -hmm. Sinking a boat is something that Dutch people don't take very, <laughs> it's not funny to them, but uh, well, anyhow, I did that and I went to the airport and just before coming back to Argentina, I sent a copy of the video to Lottie, so she's the only person who knows where the boat is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's wonderful. Okay, and then the next word, we have a series of images. Yeah, uh, fast forward to 2011, I showed this in the uh, Freeze Sculpture Park. Mm -hmm. um, this piece is called Decoy for an Andean Condor. And again, I came back to that idea of decoy that I was talking about. Um, usually when I, um, when I start a piece, more and more uh, these days, mm -hmm. um, I consider that I'm just a reader of a text that is already there. So what I do, I do a lot of research on the history of the place, but I'm very interested in history, but not only um, mm -hmm. about the historic facts or, yeah. What I'm interested in history is to, because it allows me to trace back the agencies of things that mm -hmm. are there <laughs> somehow. Uh, so yeah, Regent's Park in London used to be a, a hunting ground of Henry VIII. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided to, um, again, like a, a plan of counter-invasion to the United Kingdom. 
I decided to um, to bring over to the United Kingdom a float of Andean condors, as if they could fly all the way from Argentina um, to invade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this country. Um, so again, the piece was kind of, of um, hidden away. I, 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 I tend to do that. I, I tend to work with the, the threshold of invisibility of things. I like mm -hmm. you know, it was camouflaged against uh, amongst the, the leaves, and um, uh, yeah, that was my my mm -hmm. own invasion of this country. Mm -hmm. And then we have another piece that has to do, well, more with inhabitants, perhaps. Mm. Yeah, this was, a, I mean, that's, not, that's um, the exhibit in a space of, of, the, mm -hmm. of where the piece was shown. That is, a, is the Documenta. Mm -hmm. That was Documenta 13. Um, I was invited by one of the artists taking part in Documenta 13 to show a video that I had done um, in mm -hmm. the piece he was doing was this um, archive for the work of Donna Haraway. So um, it was really beautiful. I think it was the best match for this piece because it was, um, because it's the Swan's house, the floor is, is made out of water. So you mm -hmm. had the, the video projected there and the swans were coming in and out. Mm -hmm. So to me, it was like the perfect place and the perfect audience. <laughs> I was really happy with that. Uh, but this specific piece is called Training, and it was a collaboration with uh, Mago, who was um, a dog that I had uh, back then. He mm. was a lurcher, so a greyhound that could run 35 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, what I did with him, um, you know, I was training him in real life, as you do um, with your dogs, you know, for them to come back and sit and whatever. Um, but then I also trained him to be an actor. So I was, each time I was taking out the video camera, uh, I was changing the, the leadership. So instead of him following me, I was following him and doing exactly what he was doing, you know. So I had to run a lot to do this video. <laughs> and at some point- That's very um, interesting. That is... At some point I, I put the camera on him. So, um, yeah, this is the closest I, I got to hunting, and I quite like the... Um, uh, Let me try to show a little bit of the video. For me, the, the metaphor of the artist, like a hunter or gatherer, is something that... Um, it, it opens up my imagination a lot. So, mm -hmm. yeah, what he did, there he goes, okay, okay, maybe this is the beginning. At some point, he had the camera on him, and... Um, and he, um, it was quite nice because he was disappearing for 10, 15 minutes uh, with a mm -hmm. camera on. And when he, when he was coming back, um, for me, it was a treasure because he, with, with the footage that he was coming back, I was kind of, um, there he goes. Mm -hmm. I was edit, I was building up a narrative. So I didn't have any narrative. It was him bringing the narrative to me. Mm -hmm. um, there I go running and he's chasing me. So, yeah. Well, <laughs> that is wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, so it becomes really hectic and chaotic, and I quite like that. You know, this, um, yeah. it's, it's, it, it never um, had the pretension of being the work of a filmmaker, you know, super polished or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a, a, a type of relationship with um, this other agency that is my dog, or was my dog at that point, that. Uh, mm -hmm. I could not, yeah, the, the, the best way of doing this was by just registering. It's more of a documentary, if you want. And, and he was the camera dog. <laughs> like I love it. Did he have a chance to see the show himself? <laughs> to see. Uh, no, 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 he was here. <laughs> he was here. <laughs> but I think he did see the, I don't know if he saw the video. The video. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, wonderful. So That's wonderful. I'm very much interested in, in, um, trying to put myself in, in, well, in general, as a person in other people's shoes, but uh, mm -hmm. especially when you, when you cross such a, the cognitive barrier of what is he perceiving from reality and what is, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that was the, the motivation be behind that. Yeah. 
Okay, and now we have a, a new series. Yeah, this series, is, I call it the uh, field uh, work because mm -hmm. I used to have um, a little cart that I would go, I mean, I need mm -hmm. to explain where I live. I live in Brighton, but right in the outskirts in front of a natural park. Mm -hmm. I literally cross the road and, and I'm in, in the South Downs Park. <clears throat> And there are a couple of natural reserves here, so I'm, I'm quite blessed with that. And um, obviously, you know, it, it, my practice has started in, in that um, those years. I started in the morning, two, three hours in the woods with mm -hmm. the dog, but also with this cart where I would bring clay and, you know, like a small, a small studio. Um, so this is one of the pieces, it's called um, The How and the What. Or the what mm -hmm. and the how, I don't remember how I call it. <laughs> and it, it was after Berkeley's, um, well, it doesn't matter. Yeah, this is another one called The Beginning of Landscape. Mm -hmm. Usually these images come, uh, well, I was from phenomena of pareidolia. You know, when you're walking and suddenly you see shadows and, uh, or at least it happens to me, I'm not mm -hmm. saying it. You, know. um, you see shadows or, or the bark of a tree or, or the marks on a rock and you see something else, not mm -hmm, just what mm -hmm. it is there. So yeah, these kind of pieces came, uh, things that I see, and then I go to the studio and I make them. That's very interesting also with regards to your, what you were commenting about the importance of representation, because these are things that present themselves to you, and then you go and represent them, so in a way. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, they kind of like present to you, it's not things that you like, make an effort and I like this idea of like and they're also presented to you in this dialogue with this non-cognitive or non-linguistic let's say uh, beings in the forest right I mean so it has to do a lot with this idea of nature and integration and other forms of knowledge I think that's very interesting yeah about uh, being present as well and paying attention with all your senses and not just with your eyes or mm -hmm. um, yeah you so, see more um, of this series, yes. Out of this series came another one, but I don't know. I'm not sure what comes next. Oh, I know. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, do you want to comment a bit about the technique of how you do this? Just to... uh, this is, these are porcelain pieces. It's a, mm -hmm. a specific type of porcelain, which is um, flaxseed paper porcelain. So mm -hmm. what happens is that it shrinks a lot. Mm -hmm. in the kiln it shrinks after after i model it um i, I think it's like eight percent and once they go into the kiln it's like 20 percent more so mm -hmm. the pieces are bigger and when they go into the kiln the kiln also does its magic sometimes the magic is horrible sometimes they come <laughs> out broken but mm -hmm. sometimes it works wonders so i usually work more than what you see because you know mm -hmm. i need to allow for there is a margin of breakage and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I also, uh, this porcelain, um, type of porcelain allows to, to do a lot of detail. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not that crazy. A lot of detail is added by the kiln when, when the reduction happens. Oh, that's <laughs> super interesting, the hazardous element. Because yeah. in a way, the, one of the beautiful things about this is that, I mean, A, that they're very tactile because they have these textures. And I would always imagine you, you know, it's interesting to know this because I would always imagine you like going like hole by hole, like preparing the section. And it's nice to see that also there's a process. Oh, no, I, I, I do go hole by hole. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a combination of those, of both. Yeah, because, yeah. Uh, um, well, yeah, the more you do, the more um, potential you see. And um for instance, in the ones with holes that come afterwards, I, I can tell you a little bit more. I realized that by changing the angle of the holes, I changed the, the way the light reflects on the surface and that creates a movement I'm very interested in. Mm -hmm. This is very, um, I mean, I never talked with so much detail about these pieces, but yeah, I do put a lot of thoughts in it. <laughs> That's amazing. And, and, and body, you put your own body on it, right? Like your own, like physical movement and yeah like, it is yeah. like a, a projection of yeah of, uh, that's wonderful as you said, they are very tactile and um, yeah mm -hmm. so let's talk about this big project this is the poster of your presentation well this is this is a big project in every sense <laughs> mm -hmm. it, was, 
it was also monumental in scale, but uh, yes. it actually comes from this perspective, the perspective that I have on a table. So mm -hmm. that's why this picture is there. You couldn't, as a spectator, you couldn't see it from this angle. Mm -hmm. But um, in a way, for me, this also belongs to this serious um, um, uh, fieldwork. Because what I did, rather than going into the woods, I went into the Arsenale in Venice and I collected information from the empty pavilion of Argentina mm -hmm. there. And uh, again, it's not, um, as, I, as I mentioned with the deer, it's all information that I collect and then images start appearing. It's not mm -hmm. something that, um, it is not symbolic, more than symbolic. It is a symptom, if you want. It's things that, uh -huh. that uh, you know, that show up there as a symptom of what was going on in the building, if you want. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, horse problem. This, this wasn't made in porcelain because it would have been impossible, but it was made in resin and uh, marble dust. And it was mm -hmm. a scene with two um, human figures, the woman and the child, and a horse that was completely oversized and mm -hmm. um, a copy of that horse broken into pieces. I don't think, yeah, with mm -hmm. a shadow on, um, I don't know if, there it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, it's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, the, the, why the horse in that building? If um, if you think of how that building was made, mm -hmm. the only possibility of you know the, the building is made with bricks, um, mm -hmm. wood, and iron. The only possibility was that horses were involved because you had didn't have in the 13th century, 14th century, you didn't have any machinery. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very interested in the original. Um, I investigated the original uh, use that they were giving to this place, which was uh, where they were built, uh, making the cannonballs for the cannons that were going in the ships that were made in the Arsenale. The Arsenale mm -hmm. is like the first example in history um, of um, Fordian um, line of production. So a, boat, interesting. A, a ship could, could be made in two days from the beginning mm -hmm. of the Corderia to the end. If mm -hmm. you've been there, you will know what I'm talking about because mm -hmm. it's a very long building, etc. And um, so I was interested in that. I was also interested in the history of the Biennials itself as an institution, which is a 19th century institution. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the conflict that was bringing to me uh, the idea that I had to represent a country when I don't believe in representation. <laughs> so uh, for me, this, this course is kind of a huge decoy as well, because it, it, um, it throws meaning in, it's, it's deceptive in that it throws meaning in different directions. Um, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, depending what background you're, and also of course it's rooted in the history of equestrian sculpture that is very, you know, is ubiquitous in, in Venice. Yeah, and also at the same time, I mean, I mean, taking into account that you were making a national representation, I mean, the role of horses in Argentinian culture, you know, I mean, the role of like, the horse in like the mythology of the gaucho, even. And the, yeah, I think we are the country, the with, we are the country with the most um, uh, sculptures per inhabitants, not sculptures, monuments. <laughs> horse, uh, monuments, I'm oh, interested it's, it's ridiculous and uh well and of course you know the the equestrian sculpture is like epitome of of patriarchy you know the, mm -hmm. the hero on top of the so lots of things happen here where you don't have anyone the only thing that is on the horse is the building mm -hmm. and lots of other things are happening that you will find in that kind of imaginary imaginary mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to this other project in which you go to things very, very small things from very large I went things. The opposite. It went, I went from biennial to biennial. This was a Sao Paulo biennial, and I went exactly to the opposite. Um, Gabriel Perez Barreiro was laughing when he saw this, and he said, "This is a nano biennial." You know, because <laughs> uh, some of those pieces were like three millimeters by four and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, what you are seeing there, these are pieces of broken porcelain. What I did is um, I acquired all the porcelain ornaments in the whole of Sussex and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> None was left. And um, I placed them on the roof of my house where there is a nest of seagulls. I live by the sea. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And the seagulls can be very territorial, and they attacked the ornaments, which were all ornaments of other animals. And I was just collecting the pieces. Um, and uh, after collecting them, there was a, I put together a team of 40 women, mm -hmm. and we cover each fragment with um, uh, cotton cloth. Mm -hmm. And my brief, I mean, I was also sewing lots of them. We were in you know, these amazing gatherings around the table telling our stories. And it was fantastic. I, I didn't set up to, to gather just women, but just women that show up, you know, when I I started looking for people. And um, the idea was to, to, to fit uh, the cloth around the fragment in a way that shows uh, as tight as possible. So it shows its shape, but at the same time hides it. So again, it's mm -hmm. the idea of camouflage that is there. And by doing so, in a way, I created a fictional material because we, we, when you don't know what it is made of, mm -hmm. it looks like bones or, it, you know, depending on what section of the table you were looking at. But these were in total, um, I think there were 5,500 um, fragments. And each one of them had a label, but it was a very crazy taxonomy because each mm -hmm. label was different because it was coming from a, um, uh, a detective story that mm -hmm. I commissioned from, from a writer who was one of the artists because for the Sao Paulo Biennial, I acted as an artist and as a curator. Mm -hmm. um, that was the proposal from Gabriel Perez Barreiro. Um, mm -hmm. And um, what I like of that image is that it becomes infinite because with yeah. the reflection, with the glass, etc. Um, so this piece actually worked as my artwork in the show that I had to organize, but also as the curatorial text. Mm -hmm. um, That's so interesting. Yeah, my my show was called The Slow Bird, and mm -hmm. my um, there was a little book called The Slow Bird. It was a fictional. We call it the um, fictional um, curatorial text or something like that. I don't remember now. I love it. Uh, in English. And um, people could read the detective story, but my work was called footnote. So it was a footnote to the text and the detective story, even if it was a fictional work, it was kind of giving clues on how to interpret the other works of the other artists because there were 10 artists mm -hmm. in this section of the biennial. So, and, uh, so that, just to say hi to Gabriel, who sent his greetings earlier in the talk, and the curator of the Sao Paulo Union. And, and then also, uh, well, we have a lot of comments from people, um, most of them like saying they love your work, including uh, Alice Jones and then Tamara uh, Kostianowski. Hi to both of you, and thank you for joining us. Um, but anyway, let's go to this one. Here we see the holes. In yeah, the this, I, yeah, there is people who has phobia to, <laughs> to this. To these uh, pieces? I, I, I there is me. a phobia called uh, three. I don't remember it. But, there is yeah. a specific phobia. There is a specific phobia about holes. So, so oh, I, I mean, lot of people suffer with them. But uh, this series is called Foreigners. Um, mm -hmm. These are um, figures that I started in parallel to other porcelain pieces. It's also porcelain. Mm -hmm. They are small figures, it's more or less the, the size, they started, now they became a bit bigger, but they started being the, the size of my hand. Mm -hmm. um, some of them, uh, can you pass? Or do you have yeah. more? Or, yeah, like these ones were the first one and they, yeah, they kind of looked like the, you know, Neolithic uh, figurines mm -hmm. that um, mm -hmm. are starting to be there when, um, Apparently, there, were, there is um, a lot of these figures at the very moment when we as a species became um, sedentary, when we started um, exploiting the soil. Mm. And it was because apparently when you hold something on your hand and you take the weight or something on your hand, it's a, a fundamental part of building a concept in your mind. So children do that all the time. Mm. And uh, when the the uh, there is a theory that I quite like that's why I'm telling it uh, mm -hmm. that um, as you hold um, sorry that the concept of person was formed in this moment and you we needed the concept of person to start exploiting animals to be able to 
to eat them, you know, to make mm-hmm. work for us, etc. Mm-hmm. So it, it's also that's also my interest in horses and and dogs have to do with mm-hmm. that moment because. I'm pretty much uh, interested how, like, you know, from dogs, we took all our social skills. It comes mm. from them, apparently. And horses, is uh, the horse became domesticated at the very moment when we started uh, exploiting the soil and becoming sedentary and becoming, uh, making this, this distinction with environment that I think mm-hmm. has to be reverted. So, oh, yeah, revisited at least. So, yeah, these figures are called foreigners. Um, I use that word on purpose because it is a used word. Uh, it's a word used in a derogative way in in the UK. Mm-hmm. I'm a foreigner here after 20 years, and we, mm-hmm. I will never be English, even if I pay my taxes and I have a British passport. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it's something that I'm quite happy with because I think. Uh, it's a very good quality to be a foreigner everywhere and of everything because you can have a distance to understand things and you have other set of skills of uh, your adaptation. Your skills for adapting to a new reality are huge. So, I completely uh, agree, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also the word foreigner comes from the same root that uh, forest. Mm-hmm. Uh, that means we know it in, in Spanish, don't we? For, afuera. It's, mm-hmm. it's the one that is the outsider, the one that is outside. And I quite like that. Um, it's outside of civilization in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and can I take you back to that thing you were explaining about how um, kids and like, you know, with the figurines have to do with this idea of taking something into our hand? Because please correct me if I misunderstood, but you were talking about the necessity of creating figurines in order to recognize the idea of a person. So in a way, this theory is talking about the necessity of creating a representation of ourselves to be able to separate ourselves from us and then from animals. Is that right? That that's what happened. Uh, that's a theory about mm-hmm. Neolithic figurines. That's not why I do my own figurines. Um, no, I know, I know, I know. Mm-hmm. But uh, but you could say because all these figurines are hybrids. If you want to interpret to interpret it like that, it's, it's about the necessity of becoming more hybrid. <laughs> No, but it's fascinating because, again, it has to do with what you were describing before about your interest in representation, the idea that our own recognition as humans and thus different from nature comes through the act of like creating a representation of what we are. It's like fascinating. It's not only creating a representation, it's weighing it on your hands. Weighing it, That's most important. That's why I, I don't want to encourage people to touch these pieces. <laughs> <laughs> but but. I, they are tactile for a reason. You know, well, you can touch them with your eyes. <laughs> and it goes again to what you were saying right at the beginning of the talk about your need when you were like, you know, just finishing school to try to, if you were going to do a sculpture, feel the weight of your own body. Yeah. By doing, you know, acrobatics or by doing theater, like like embodying your own body to be able to, you know, this idea of how like embodiment also has to do with external, like like understanding the weight, but also exterioralizing it. I don't know if I'm saying it right. Like which representation is a way to exterioralize something. Mm-hmm. Anyway, this is fascinating. This is great. Okay, so... Um, the series is fascinating and it's also very interesting um, going back to the idea of representation and, you know, and, you know, the, the tension in between figuration and abstraction. And, and then you go to use more than one figure and they merge, they like melt together. Yeah, they, they started like individuals, then they started, there was a, um, a series of maternities at some point. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, you know, because here I use a lot of my pareidolia skills mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because I, I just start building a shape and then I start seeing things in that shape. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not that I'm, I, I do not set up, so I'm going to do one with a hand like this. They just show up, you know, I don't know how to put it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't take credit for that. <laughs> uh, it's something that it, it goes with the... But in a way, it was like, I mean, if this series is chronological and you were saying that it started with one figure and then pregnant figures, and then you have these figures in which you have like, like almost a mother holding a child and then... And then, together. yeah, they started like, like these, they, they, started, they became families. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I quite like that. There is a, a subtle um, balance between figuration and abstraction mm-hmm. uh, that, yeah, I do kind of intuitively. But if you if they become too figurative, they, they doesn't work. Yeah. And also but... between inside and outside, because in a way, um, the more abstract they are, they become like, as if they were the outside I don't know if as if it were a sock <laughs> the other way around. I don't know how. I to that's very interesting, but also I mean, in this tension in between figuration and you know and representation, there's also like this process in which the figures merge, and but each figure still keeps its individual features, but at the same time they're merged, and I think that's a beautiful like like metaphor of like the contemporary concept of family and the importance of like having like the family, but also the individuals, you know, and how like a family is a composite of individuals at the same time that is an entity, you know, I love that metaphor. Yeah, it, it's, it's also a merge of a, a figure and, and background in a way. You Absolutely. Know, something mm-hmm. I know, yeah. Uh, that's why I was saying for me, the way the light reflects on the surface is something I put a lot of attention um, Mm-hmm. And I, the the white background as well, um, you know, I try different things, but I think the white background is the one that works the best because of that as well. Um, That's so interesting because one would think that you would need a bl- black background, right? Which is also typical of no, like the Neolithic, yeah. They become sculptures and I think in this way they have like an aura that they expand towards Absolutely. the background. It works, you know, yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it all depends. It's also, I've been doing this series since 2013, and especially the ones that are more like foam like or, or um, coral like. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it kind of coincided with the crisis that is still is going on, but at that point, you know, the, now we have a crisis over a crisis <laughs> over a crisis. But mm-hmm. um, with the migrants, you know, the refugees crisis in Europe. So people were kind of seeing that. Then are people, I don't know, now with the pandemic, they they see the virus. I don't really care much about what they see. <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. for me, um, um, for me, it's important the gesture of repeating them beyond that, because uh, with a repetition comes, it becomes a population that I'm bringing mm-hmm. into the world. And mm-hmm. yeah. And also change, they change as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, so and the last images, I'm gonna need to show them in the computer because I'm having a tech reason and they're not showing up here. But if people bear with me, we can show them here. I know it's not as pretty and I send my apologies. But yes, this is a series, we'll go back to the beginning in a way, this is a very previous work that you did. Um, yeah, this work I started, uh, it t- took 10 years. Um, mm-hmm. It is the most um, emotional engage I've ever been to a piece. It's called the reconstruction of the portrait of Pablo Miguel's. Um, at some point there was a competition for, um, they were going to do a memorial park in Argentina that now it exists already for 10 years, um, mm-hmm. which is the Parque de la Memoria. And mm-hmm. um, and uh, yeah, my proposal was to recover at least one um, image of this boy who was 14 year old at the moment of his disappearance. And again, mm-hmm. here is, is something that has to do with, um, so what I did is I tried to reconstruct um, a portrait of Pablo as close as I could imagine him without having any, I mean, he had died or disappeared. We don't know mm-hmm. what happened to him 25 years before I started doing this. And all I had was um, a D, uh, an ID photo, a very small photo. Mm-hmm. Um, so something quite funny happened to me with this. Um, I, I'm going to just tell a little anecdote about a specific moment where I went through all sorts of, of um, ways of approaching how to reconstruct the portrait of someone you never, you never met, you will never meet, you don't have a mm-hmm. picture, you only have what people tell you about him. And um, can I ask you something? Why did you yes. choose him from the many, many, many thousands of names among the uh, I chose him because I thought, because of my my age, I didn't feel authorized to talk about um, 
the people you know people who who had um other responsibilities back then who were adults mm -hmm. back then so what i decided to do was to choose the case of someone who was my own age at the time of his disappearance mm -hmm. um and i had a hard time looking for the case because uh most of the children um yeah i, I also because i wanted to find someone uh, a case where one of the parents had survived mm -hmm. and uh, most of the children were taken with with both parents and every, all the family died or yeah mm -hmm. but i found the case of pablo and um, and i worked very very closely with his uh, father mm -hmm. and um so we, yeah what i wanted to say is that i at the moment you know um this was 20 years ago so there was no enough software um, to do the right forensics to to and thankfully so because then I was put in the situation of of needing to imagine him mm -hmm. and it happened I was uh, I put three years in in his head <laughs> in, mm -hmm. in trying to make the head and at some point I, I caught myself in the studio saying um, oh how stupid I am this is not like this it's like this you know when I was modeling um, a part of the chin I remember and I caught myself thinking that, and I said, and how do I know how he was? But I realized I already had an image in my head of how he was, and that was the only thing that was important. Mm -hmm. And that, so, you know, talking about representation and how, you know, I had a big, big, big um, responsibility here because I didn't want to do anything. Uh, I mean, this is 40 meters away from the shore. No one yes. has access to the face. And it was always thought like that. So I could have easily put anything there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Pablo's father told me, because um, I was really anguished. I mean, I was sleepless nights and so on. And Pablo's father told me, Claudia, whatever you put there, for me, Pablo will be there. So mm. that was a big relief for me when he said that. But even so, you know, I felt like a, as an artist, I wanted to push it to the limit. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way, I became like a medium, if you want, yeah, with mm -hmm. this piece, in the sense that um, I had to sense him. I cannot put it in another way. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that's all I could do as an artist. And I think mm -hmm. that was an exercise in understanding what it is for me to be an artist and what, why I wanted to be an artist that I tried to apply in everything I do. Yes, absolutely. Mm. But also you did, sorry about the light, <laughs> I'm trying to show the images better <laughs> from the computer. <laughs> Um, but also, you know, it's, it's, it's super beautiful what you're saying about this sense of responsibility as an artist, because in this case, you were representing, you know, it's always necessary representation, but you, you had the, the weight of, you know, what the father said, you know, of like reappearing somebody who had, you know, and the word that we use in Argentine history, you know, is disappearance, you know, so you were trying to do something impossible at the same time, which is like reappearing this uh, his. There was a moment um, mm -hmm. when the, um, the engineers, they were setting up, I mean, the sculpture is, is welded into a kind of H that is mm -hmm. floating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you, like in a show, you want to, you're setting up a show, so you put your picture, you take some distance, you know, more to the left, more to the right. In this mm -hmm. way, in, in this case, they were there were there 40 meters in the middle of the and I was on the shore and I was saying this way that way you know with a handy and once it was done it was done you know like uh, we mm -hmm. had to, that is anchored and so on so the, the engineers came back from the boat and they showed me um, a little paper with the coordinates the latitude and longitude because they had to add it to international maps of navigation Wow. So that every, any object you put in the water, you know, people need to know you shouldn't go there because you can crash your boat or whatever. Um, and for me, when I saw that piece of paper, um, mm. I'm done, you know. Yeah. Um, I put him on the map again. Mm -hmm. somehow. I mean, not me, you know, but um, we all Yeah, did. yeah, I understand. Of course. It of was course. really amazing. And um, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And also a super heavy aspect for those of you, I'm going to say it myself because I know it might be hard for you, but um, a super like powerful and like, you know, and uh, in a dramatic, but dramatic in a good way about these pieces that the location like deep in the river, you know, that is the river where many of these people were thrown like alive or dead, their bodies were thrown there uh, as a way to kill them or to get rid of the bodies. So and this is a piece that for anybody who grew up in Argentina, including myself, you know, we all go there and cry. It's a memorial, you know, it's truly a memorial. It's really beautiful. And it's a really powerful Yeah, it was the, the challenge was to do something um, um, light, mm -hmm. luminous, out mm -hmm. of such a dark history. And for me, an, another instruction I gave the engineers is that I don't, that, you know, uh, the Rio de la Plata, the river plate, is a tidal uh, um, river mm -hmm. and it has, it's like, um, it can uh, change four meters depending on the moment of the, mm -hmm. of the day of the year. And um, and I told them, I mean, I don't never want this, the water to cover him. It has to go with the river. Mm. Because it, it also, yeah. you know, it's a completely different metaphor if, the water, the, if you can see it appearing or disappearing with the water going yeah. up and, and it could have been sinister and you don't want to do anything sinister so that decision was very very conscious yeah and i've seen it with a very low tide and you see the whole structure so yeah important. let's show it one more time you're gonna have to give me one second so i can mm. my apologies to the audience for my technical Yes, but this is the distance, and this is such a beautiful. Yeah, this is that's photo. a picture of a uh, photographer Guadalupe Miles. She's um, a wonderful artist. It's a yeah. wonderful picture, and she she knows about light as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. And do you want to mention this? I mean, I think that this anecdote. I mean, we have six more minutes, and this is a beautiful way yeah, to close. Um, mm -hmm. Um, I live in Brighton, and Brighton is famous uh, for um, the gatherings of uh, starlings in the pier. And, mm -hmm. you know, starlings in their flocks, they create, they, they're called murmurations, and they create these amazing shapes. So, of course, when I moved here, I was really interested in in their behavior also because they nest in, in a tree in the back of my garden sometimes. Um, nice. So it's, it's very usual for me to see them. And starlings, the, the way they move um, in such a coordinated way uh, without uh, uh, clashing with each other or collapsing or anything is a mystery to science, even to these days. Uh, and mm -hmm. um, the most recent theory is that there is a magnetic field, that, that they have this sixth sense that is, a, or, I don't know, whatever sense, number sense, mm -hmm. um, that they can sense the, the electricity of the, you know, whatever. Um, but back in the 80s, it was this um, computer scientist who came up with three, um, uh, three rules that if you apply them to any, um, 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 yeah, any object moving, it, it behaves as a murmuration of a starlings. So mm. um, I started... Uh, with some students first in Nicaragua, we did first an exercise of this, and I saw it from above and thought, this looks amazing. You know, look, they, they start looking at starling. What I like of that ex 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 starling murmuration, what I like of that exercise is that um, you need collectively to pay attention to each other because mm -hmm. you need to keep a list as well as certain rules. I don't want to bore you with that. So taking that into account, I proposed Parque de la Memoria when it was the 40th anniversary of, of uh, the dictatorship in 2016. I proposed them to gather 500 uh, uh, teenagers, 14 year old, mm -hmm. the same age that Pablo uh, had when he disappeared. And, um, and 500 because 500 is the number that is calculated of the missing children that mm -hmm. um, the great mothers of Plaza de Mayo already um, uh, were able to recover. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's, I, I've lost the account, but I think it's around 130 or something now. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, these were 500 teenagers that show up on that day um, from the, um, 
Colegio Carlos Pellegrini. Uh -huh. uh, who, the, the, this school, secondary school, was very, very collaborative. And, uh, and we did a murmuration, obviously, on the ground. And this was motivated also for, by the family of birds that started nesting on Pablo and around the sculpture mm -hmm. as soon as we installed it. Um, that we yeah. know it's always the same. There is one there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a type of cormoran. Uh, and we know they are always the same ones because the people next to the Parque de la Memoria, there is the um, University of Buenos Aires, the science department. Mm -hmm. And the biologists there, they, are, um, they put rings on these birds and they're monitoring them. So we know that it's always the same individual that it's stands so on the head. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I don't have better documentation about this. Um, I mean, I have, I cannot disclose it because, yeah, that's not. No, but it's, but, it's, it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful performance, if you like, you know, um, it's gorgeous that you were able to do that to homage him, but also to, to you know, and how it relates to the rest of your practice. You know, I think there's, you know, it's, it's a very um, truthful work to yourself and to to the community that is informing, which is, you know, like ancient history, you know. So that is wonderful. Um, so, no, thank you so much, Claudia. I think it was a beautiful conversation. I don't know if we have two more minutes, if anybody has any specific question. Um, and I don't know if you want to share with people any project you're working on or, you know, like... Um, yeah, I'm can. working... Uh, uh, this year I have um, a couple of shows. Uh, there is a show coming at Cecilia Brunson Projects in London. Wonderful, uh, yeah. There is, um, I'm also taking part in a show... Um, in Stuck in Leuven in Belgium, mm -hmm. um, which is called, here I have it, Word for Empathy, um, <laughs> narrated by Karen Fershoren. Mm -hmm. And in April, um, quite a few of these pieces will be shown in a show um, curated by Valeria Gonzalez in Buenos Aires called Symbiology, mm -hmm. which is a kind of a, a collection of, of um, artwork by Argentinian artists on post-humanism and, you know, not on, but that, you know. About, I, I about, was my cat, about, talking about post-humanism, my cat just came by. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, thank you so much, um, Claudia, and it's been a beautiful talk, and thank you so much for sharing your work with us, and we hope we can see it in all those shows you just mentioned. Thank you very much. Gracias. Thank you for everything. I'm thrilled that we did it in one hour. <laughs> yeah, we did it. And we talked about everything. It's amazing. <laughs> Good job selected. Thank you, Claudia. Well, thank you. Bye-bye.